Hello, this is the fourth lesson in the Black Mirror scheme of work. This lesson is all about uh, the industry uh, elements of Black Mirror. And the objectives for this session is to explore the patterns of ownership and control in television production and to consider processes of production and distribution within a global context. Which all sounds rather complicated, but I think uh, you should find it fairly simple as we go along. A lot of information and also some uh, uh, discussion and debate uh, and ideas as to what the future of TV holds. So we're going to talk first of all about the processes of production, distribution and circulation and learn a little bit about the background of uh, Black Mirror and uh, how it came to be, I suppose. Um, Black Mirror, as you know, was created by Charlie Brooker and uh, producer Annabelle Jones. The first season was produced by Zepatron, which is a division of the Dutch media company Endemol Shine, and it was made for Channel 4. To stay with the kind of uh, roots, or if you like, the origins of the TV show, uh, Charlie Brooker was actually inspired by the intimate relationships people were developing with digital technologies and wanted to explore what an extrapolation of these re relationships might mean for individuals, but also for society. There's a really lovely interview uh, that Brooker did with the Guardian newspaper, who he writes for, on a, who he used to write for on a regular basis anyway. Um, so just read the interview about his intentions originally, but also make notes as, on the other TV shows that were clear inspirations for the Black Mirror series. So sticking with those um, production. Uh, context we'll look at the economic factors uh, which had an impact on uh, Black Mirror and as we mentioned before the show was uh, originally made for Channel 4 in fact the first two seasons were produced by Channel 4 so a little bit of more research into the history of the network can help us understand the context of that show in a little bit more depth so in the UK we have uh, what five what are known as terrestrial channels and then we have digital and st satellite channels uh, things like sky and other sort of multi-channel uh, services that are off offered and available through cable and satellite television and channel four is one of those five terrestrial channels uh, but it is unique uh, as an entity in british broadcasting because it is both commercially funded and a public service broadcaster it is essentially publicly owned as it's a not-for-profit organisation. So you have the BBC, which is publicly funded, channels 4, 5 and ITV, as well as the cable and satellite channels, which are commercially funded. All of the terrestrial channels have a public service remit, which uh, the uh, cable and satellite networks do not have. But this is where... Channel 4's uniqueness comes in because it is not-for-profit organisation and therefore it's kind of essentially owned by the public um, because it's uh, not privately owned. Let's look at this in a little bit more detail then. So the Channel 4 Television Corporation is a public corporation uh, that belongs to the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport that was established in the 1990s. The channel itself was established in 1982 as a way of providing a fourth television service to the UK in addition to the licence fee funded BBC One and BBC Two and the single commercial broadcasting network ITV. So let's look a, a little bit more closely at some of these aspects. First of all, the idea that it's commercially funded. A commercially funded channel is funded through its advertising. Uh, they'll generate revenue by selling advertising spot and commercial breaks of different TV shows. Now, the rate that an advertiser will charge is based on the time of the day that the advert will be shown and the length of the advert. For example, peak time adverts are more expensive than daytime adverts because more people will see it. What makes Channel 4 unique is not only is it commercially funded, but it's publicly owned. Now, publicly owned organisations are run on a not-for-profit basis. This means they're designed to serve the interests of the public rather than shareholders. So any surplus money that's made by an organisation like Channel 4 is reinvested and it goes towards the cost of making new programmes. Essentially, they are non-profit making. However, 
Despite the fact that the first two seasons were made for Channel 4, after the two seasons, it was announced that Black Mirror would become a co-production with the US institution and streaming giant Netflix. So in 2014, Netflix bought exclusive US distribution rights and then later won a bidding war to produce the show. Initially, this was meant to be a co-production with Channel 4, but after issues regarding budget and creative freedom, Brooker and Jones opted to work exclusively with Netflix. And in 2015, the streaming channel commissioned 12 new episodes, which essentially became seasons 3 and 4. So there's a whole ton of videos out there on uh, Netflix and how it works and the uh, various strategies it has. And some of them are really excellent, but a little bit old. And some of them are maybe a little bit dull because it is essentially talking about business figures and so on. However, this one hits a nice balance. So what you should do whilst watching this video is make notes on their business model and also write down any key statistics relating to Netflix success. Whether you first got DVDs in the mail or you're four seasons into your latest binge watch, you're one of about 215 million subscribers worldwide, making it the most popular subscriber-based streaming platform, period. So pop up some corn and grab your Snuggie, because it's time for the Pareto Labs breakdown of Netflix. While Netflix is best known as the top entertainment streamer in the world, to understand its history, you have to go all the way back to 1997, in the land of the VHS. Back in those days, a young, innovative tech company had recently gone public, called Amazon.com. And a young, innovative technology format was gaining steam in the entertainment world, called DVD. This is DVD. Netflix co-founder Reed Hastings decided to combine Amazon's internet and mail-based business model for selling books with the lightweight, durable, and fast-growing DVD category. DVD. Thus, Netflix was born. The company tested out various business models and quickly settled on an unlimited DVD rental subscription service for a monthly fee. The Netflix.com website also featured an algorithm-powered movie recommendation engine based on user ratings. The early days of what we now know as the algorithm, that's actually what they decided to highlight when they filed to go public. They positioned themselves as a website that had this really strong recommendations engine that had this add-on DVD rental business attached to it. Even from the beginning, the algorithm was front and center. The company launched globally in 2016 and is now available in over 190 countries. So how does the Netflix product work exactly? And what's up with the famous algorithm we always hear about? Let's dive in. Netflix is an SVOD platform, meaning subscription video on demand. Users pay one flat monthly fee and in exchange, they can stream all the films and TV shows they want. The algorithm is used to analyze all the viewership data across all users and over time to personalize each user's experience and title recommendations. Now, the company doesn't collect a lot of personal information. Ultimately, it's just about what we like to watch, which the algorithm is constantly monitoring and using to provide its recommendations. It doesn't fall victim to stereotypes, you know, men like this, women like that. It doesn't matter. The, the user base, given what they're watching, is providing all that insight on what they like to watch, and that's what Netflix uses. Every part of the Netflix UI, from the shows and films that show up in your home screen to the box art for those titles, are personalized specifically for you. Netflix has invested in all types of movie and TV content to attract fans of all stripes. Licensing deals are split up by geography, and not every deal is for global rights. That means the catalog of available movies and shows to watch differs by country. But Netflix originals, like Stranger Things and Squid Game, are typically available worldwide. Netflix competes with other streaming services. But if you zoom out a bit, it competes with other forms of entertainment, like going to a sports game 
or an amusement park. Or you could zoom out way further, like Reed Hastings, who once said Netflix competition was sleep. What makes Netflix so successful? Turns out, simplicity is the key to its success. The company has famously stayed out of live news or sports and does not sell third-party advertising on its platform. And while it has dabbled in consumer products, it's not a strong focus for the company. In contrast, check out a competitor, Disney's Flywheel, on our Disney Company Breakdown, right here at Pareto Labs. With such focused attention on churning out shows and films, how does the company decide which programs to make? So some people think that all of our content decisions are made by the algorithm, but fortunately that's, that's not true. AI hasn't totally taken over just yet. Ultimately, content decisions are made by the creative executives who are evaluating each project on their artistic and creative merit. But the cool thing is there is this strong data layer on top that says of all the different stories that are compelling and rich, which are the ones that are gonna be most likely to satisfy Netflix subscribers, especially commensurate with their budgets. The success of titles is based on their efficiency. That is, how a title's viewership stacks up with its cost. In recent years, the company has invested strongly in international productions, as an increasing share of new members comes from outside the US and the English-speaking world. Let's take a look at how this global streaming giant with about 214 million subscribers in over 190 countries translates into dollars and cents. In 2020, the company generated 25 billion of revenue from about 190 million subscribers who each paid an average of $10.91 a month. 46% of the company's streaming revenue came from its 72 million subscribers in the US and Canada who paid an average of $13.32 for their monthly subscriptions. The company's 25 billion of revenue yielded 2.8 billion of net income, an 11% net profit margin. The company's operations also generated 2.4 billion of cash flow. For some time, Netflix was criticized in the press as losing money because it was burning cash every year. In fact, 2020, was the first year since 2014 that the company's operations were cash flow positive. Where is all that cash been going? You guessed it, to power the giant content factory. In 2021, the company says it plans to spend 17 billion of cash on content. Now that's a lot of binge watching. One more episode? Yeah. <laughs> if this is still a bit hazy or you'd like to know more, not to worry. We cover the differences between cash flow and profit in our course, how to read financial statements. You can even learn about how TV and movie licensing deals affect cash flow from the former CFO of Hulu. Be sure to check it out. As a subscription-based business, there are two metrics that are absolutely crucial to Netflix success. Subscriber LTV and churn. LTV is the average amount of money you're going to make on each subscriber over the lifetime of their subscription. And the way that you do that is try and generate enough pricing power to increase the average revenue per user. That's going to be the price of the subscription and minimizing churn, which is the percent of your subscription base that leaves the service any given month, year, or period. At the end of the day, Netflix has the same fundamental objective as every other subscription-based business. Maximize LTV while minimizing churn. So that's the Pareto Labs company breakdown on Netflix. And there's lots more business insight where that came from right here on ParetoLabs.com. In fact, we invite you to watch the very first Pareto course, How to Read Financial Statements, so that you can better analyze any company's financial breakdown, including your own. So like, share, and subscribe to Pareto Labs today. And stay informed of Netflix progress, because we think this love story of art and science is a total binge watch with many more seasons to come.
Okay, so a lot of information there, and obviously you can find out a lot of information about Netflix across YouTube and other uh, websites as well, although they've been quite guarded about their um, viewing figures um, in the past. They're now opening up a bit more um, and uh, revealing the the uh, most watched shows on the streaming platform. Um, let's go and rewind a little bit and think... Um, back to when Brooker and Jones signed up with Netflix. Um, and this was a major thing for Black Mirror, of course. And due to the global reach of Netflix, by 2016, Black Mirror was then available in 80 countries, and obviously even more now. As a response to this, and to keep things, I guess, as uh, in-house as possible, uh, Brooker and Jones formed Broke and Bones production company in 2020, uh, so that they could continue making Black Mirror for Netflix themselves. And when that move happened, when the transition over from Channel 4 to Netflix happened, um, Lucy Dyke, who's one of the Netflix producers, said that this move for Black Mirror would ensure that they were making episodes that were bigger and better and more international in the first two seasons, which obviously were based in the UK. So let's have a think about this, and you might need to revisit some of the older episodes, but in what ways is San Junipero different in its style and tone to the first two series? So a little hint here when thinking back to those first two series. Think about maybe the shift in production values, but also some of the settings as well. OK, this is an industry lesson, so we need to get some theory in. And we're going to look at David Hesmergulch and his media industries or cultural industries uh, theory, rather. And actually, rather than work through this one by one, we're going to start with his final point. Um, that... Uh, the radical potential of the internet has been limited by the domination of large cultural industries, uh, which, when you think about it, are increasingly indivisible. There are tech giants like Google, Apple, Amazon. But in contrast to this, Netflix and some of the other web-based streaming services actually invest vast sums of money in their productions and yet leave almost all the creative control to the showrunners, which has actually led to a diverse range of products that are unafraid to take risks and attempt to push the envelope as to what makes truly successful television. So, research some of these. What are some of the series that Netflix has constructed, uh, produced itself, showrunners it's hired and allowed them the free reign? Make some notes on the shows that have done this, but also the things that make them groundbreaking and challenging. How are they part of this so-called golden era of television? Okay, let's carry on. We'll move on to this second idea then, that uh, the largest companies now operate across different media industries. And here, Hesmer Gulch's assertions is that cultural industries are really kind of different to other manufacturers that you might encounter. Media techs are purchased usually just once, and then continually reused rather than wearing out and having to be replaced as we would do with other household items or goods. This means that the intellectual property and the range of products using it must be sold and resold in different forms very carefully to maintain a profit, which leads to heavy investment in familiar products, including stars, and less experimentation. So let's have a look at the success of Netflix. Look at the notes you made from the previous video that you watched um, and also some of your own research um, and get a breakdown of how many subscribers Netflix has accrued on a year by year basis. But also reflect on the risks that have been associated with the Netflix business model and what they'll have to do to ensure the continued success of the platform. Will they get to a saturation point? when it comes to subscribers. Okay, moving on back to Hesma Gulch and looking at this last idea, all about what Netflix has to do to deal with risk and ensure it keeps making a profit. Because as Netflix is subscription-based, it means that it is free from some of the constraints that uh, other networks might have but it still needs to make entertaining shows that engage with a range of TV audiences. 
But unlike TV channels using a commercial model, where the funding is dependent on advertising, they've got more opportunity for experimentation. Black Mirror is a good example of a show which explores challenging themes without the pressures of having to draw in a huge audience and worrying and scaring advertisers. So, let's look at both sides of the story here. First of all, let's consider, in what ways would you say that Black Mirror is a risk for a company like Netflix? In other words, how does it challenge or um, maybe uh, is, does not conform to convention or takes risks? And then considering the flip side of this, in what ways would you say that Netflix can use Black Mirror as a way of maximising its audiences? Okay, so quite a lot of different ideas covered here in terms of uh, how Black Mirror and San Junipero itself um, is produced and how we can apply some theory. But I just want to finish off this session by considering the future of television. Um, so a few questions for you to make notes on and maybe do a little bit of research on as well that will allow you to kind of consider where television is going. First of all, what do we understand by this term non-linear viewing with regards to TV and how it relates to not Netflix as well? So what we've seen is the rise in digital streaming service and on-demand sites for individual networks uh, has dramatically changed how audiences watch television. So explore this idea. How have digital streaming services, what are the things they've done to change that relationship and to change the way we watch? And how can we consider this change to be an actual appeal of the TV we watch? If it's changed how we watch TV and can turn it into an appeal... Has it changed who is watching? Has the audience for television changed? Because this might be seen as a more inclusive way of broadcasting. Is that the case? Do you feel that this change in our viewing habits and the way we interact with the television as a user, maybe more than a passive audience member, is that more inclusive? Or does it actually risk increase the risk of no one seeing a show. And if that's the case, that there is a possibility that fewer people will see a show because of the choice that's involved, does this place a greater emphasis on marketing? So, in other words, if you're allowing the freedom of choice to your subscribers rather than scheduling TV shows to be on at a specific time, how do you get an audience to watch your show in the first place what ways can you guarantee or what guarantees are there that someone will watch a show think about things like marketing and what a show can do to get itself up to the top of the netflix list of uh, people watching okay a lot of food for thought there and some questions to consider for uh, con thinking about the future of TV, but a lot of information about the economic and industry context of Black Mirror, and in particular the San Junipero episode. So thanks very much for watching, and uh, there's always more research you can do into this, so keep collecting those facts and bits of information about Netflix, Brooker's influences and plans for the future, um, as well as uh, the future of television itself. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.